Yeah, hi. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's, it's amazing to be in this room full of people. Uh, you all are like people that have come from various parts of my life and also people who I don't know yet. So yeah, just thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to start out with a couple of thank yous. First of all, I wanted to thank MOCA staff and also the Working Artist Project just generally. Uh, it's an amazing amount of support for uh, Atlanta artists and I've had a really incredible year doing this project through that. I also wanted to thank the people who helped me make this show. There are even more names than I'm going to say right now, but the assistants who directly worked with me through MOCA's apprenticeship program are Aaron Palovic, who's back here, helping with the sound, and then also Camden Hunt and Chase Chamberlain. Um, working with any assistance at all is super new to me, except my daughter, who gets roped into helping me with everything. But it was so good, um, yeah, working with other artists and getting used to sort of the pacing of actually having help. I realized that the ways that I was casting concrete were like super whack because I was just leaning things on everything, but having another set of hands is like something, I'm, I feel like now I really can't go back. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I thought about many different ways to approach how to tell you all about this show. There are so many different stories in the materials themselves. There are so many different stories in each of the sculptures. And rather than try to fully explain each of them one by one, I think I'm just going to go with um, explaining to you my relationship to these materials and how the inherent qualities of the materials led me down the paths to make the work that is here. So I'm going to start with the title, which is actually one of the last things that I made in the show. I was really hesitating deciding on a title because I had a few different ones. But what I was working with, with the title, The Gentle Empty, is the idea of breath. Um, all neons are made with a person's breath. So when you see all of the neons that you've ever seen in Las Vegas, in commercial signs everywhere, they have somebody's breath involved in making them. There's not a commercial way to just bend the neons into the shapes that they are. So those are all handmade. And part of the thing that breath does inside the actual making of the neon is it gives it positive pressure so it doesn't cave in as you're moving it around. So you take the glass, starts with like a tube of glass, and you put it in some fire, which is a little scary. It's very hot and it's a very big flame and it is doing damage kind of to the material, right? It's like melting it so you are exposing it to this level of damage but carefully and you turn it around so that it hopefully heats evenly. I'm not good at that yet. <laughs> like sign benders say you have to spend like a thousand hours over the flames before you can do it. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. But like, no, they're kind of right. It's really hard. Uh, but it's one of the things I love about it is you put it in this like difficult situation. The glass is like shocked by the heat of the fire and you move it around gently so that it will move with you. And it's a very gentle thing. Like working with the fire makes you slow down, makes you sort of have to connect with the glass because you have to pay such attention. Before that I've worked with a lot of steel and in blacksmithing it's more like, it's more brutal because you just see the metal turn bright hot red and then you know exactly when it's hot enough to work with. And you can like grab it and like move it as it's getting cold. But with glass, you have to feel kind of when it starts melting and then you have to move it gently and you have to stop moving while it's cooling. Otherwise, you'll just crack it. You'll just explode. Um, but one of the cool things is if you crack it, you can still use it again and again and again and again. So it's actually a very sustainable, very old kind of lighting. Another thing that I love about it is is in that process, if you mess up, 
you're, you don't have to throw a bunch of things in the trash, you just kind of redirect. So in being new to working with this medium, a lot of the shapes are a combination of like what I can plan versus what my body can actually do. So instead of having a lot of control over the material, it's more like a dialogue. It's more like really a collaboration. And so yeah, in making this show, I was thinking a lot about the, the liquid and solid states of the glass itself that make neon. I was also thinking of concrete. Concrete is a material that's been fascinating me for years. I think I started working with it back in like 2017, um, casting concrete into swimming pool inflatables. And part of that was a bit of a curiosity of making like a messy mold. Um, I was also, I wanted to see the inside. I just want to see what like the inside that's made for air looks like instead of the outside. And it, so the concrete was also like a way to get in there. I had tried expanding foam, which was like a giant mess and also not at all <laughs> environmentally friendly. It's like every state says it'll give you cancer. So um, I was like, I think I want to do something else. But yeah, so concrete, I would pour it into inflatables and because the concrete gets hot, the inflatables would melt. So the, instead of looking like the actual inflatable pool toy, um, I've done like a pool noodle kind of thing, and a, but most of them were palm trees that I was doing. Instead of looking like the original, it looked like this like wider sort of melty version. And I really liked that again, like the sort of choosing the process that I wanted to do and then also allowing the flexibility for the materials to be like a little bit difficult, but also in a really beautiful way. So um, thinking of the different types of materials, glass and concrete are both really strong and really brittle. So there's different ways that materials are going to act when you bend them, like brittle versus malleable. You can think that on like a big spectrum. So concrete, even though it seems really different than glass, it really shares these qualities of being workable in its liquid state and then in its finished solid state. It doesn't flex at all. It will crack and make cracks. So something that's malleable would be like steel, where if you bend it, it bends. Um, so that's like the difference in materials being malleable versus brittle. So I had had this relationship with concrete and this relationship with steel working in the past and glass was just like, glass is just such a different animal. It behaves so differently, but in this sort of zoomed out way, it really reminded me of working with concrete where it like, it has its own agenda. Um, once it's done, it's done and it's super strong, but there is this, there's this precariousness in the making. There's also a speed in the making. Um, with the glass, you heat it slowly, but then you have to move fast and stop. And the concrete, um, Aaron knows this for sure, and anybody else who casts concrete is like, you have a plan, but then it gets crazy because the concrete might be hardening faster than you meant, or like something might start falling over from the weight, and you're like, okay, well now this is this shape, and you're sort of like, the actual, like I lay out my tools all neatly, but the actual process is like a scramble that I find very thrilling, um, and also very cool in how the process itself really makes the resulting sculpture be the shape that it is. So yeah, the gentle empty. I was thinking about breath, um, I work a lot with sound, so I was also thinking about silence and how silence is important in music as much as the sound is, um, but also how silence and how breath, they seem empty, but there's usually at least some content, you know, as long as we're not in a vacuum, right? So I was thinking about how this room is this like specific shape and there's all of this space between the, the neons where the neon sort of, the light that it's casting sort of fades out and like blends on the wall. So I was thinking of that as like the breath between, the space between, the silence between, um, I was thinking of it as humming, like if, I know this is a little bit like, already but if the if the neons are like the note then the like outside of it is kind of like the reverb or the hum or the little like the leak the light leak aside so neons are so um they're so bold as a medium right it's like a light and i think we like to look at light like a campfire like 
you know, a little fly does or whatever. But that's what I think one of the things so special about neons is like all of the details around them will come after. Like whatever I'm going to put with the neon, even if it's a big pile of concrete, even if it's like some ropes that I've carefully woven in such a way, the neon will come first and then all of the little wires and all of the materials around it will be slowly seen after. So I really also like sort of root for the underdogness of all these materials that are also there coexisting with the neon. Okay, so let's see, where do I want to go from there? The first piece that I made for the show is that yellow one just to the left of the wall label. And that one is called um, doing the dishes after the party when you arrive at your own hands. And I was thinking about this moment when you sort of come back into the awareness of yourself. It ties in with what I was just saying about this sort of like underdog feeling of all the details around the neon or what you're gonna see second. Um, I really enjoy that feeling of like right after something exciting happened when you're sort of falling down. You're like sort of on the down crest, but you sort of feel calm. And I really associate that feeling with doing the dishes. Like if I, I really want to do the dishes at other people's party, but I don't want them to think that the party's over because I just like want to do that. So I'll do it sort of sneakily. And it's this little dance where I'm like, I'm like doing the dishes, but in like a fun way so people can stay. But yeah. So anyway, um, I really just enjoy that feeling of like after you've had all this like hubbub where you sort of come back to yourself in the super mundane feeling. So like the yellow is literally thinking of like dipping something in and out of water because I feel like the neon shine on the vinyl is like water. And um, this piece sort of encapsulates the thing that happens a lot around the different works in the show, which is that all of the materials have sort of come together from something else. So the yellow vinyl was one of those like flaps that hangs down on a walk-in fridge um, that a friend of mine and often collaborator, one of my favorite artists, Jordan Stubbs, he was like moving out of his studio and he had a pile of this yellow vinyl. It was like, here, take it. This was from a walk-in fridge and all the vinyl was getting like cut down, so I just kept it. So I had it and I never knew what to do with it until I got this idea of like being obsessed with just wanting to see the neon somehow dip in and out of it. And I couldn't really figure out how to do that for a while. And I had the roll of vinyl just sitting there and I was looking at it and thinking about it. And then I cut out this shape for a different purpose. Like I made this zigzaggy sculpture as a commission for MailChimp actually, it's kind of like a weird story, but they were doing a photo shoot and they wanted a sculpture. So anyway, th those were like leftover pieces of oak. Um, and it's like local oak that I found and it's super old so it's super hard to work with and it probably wasn't the best material to use for that but I had it sitting around and I realized the potential of the dipping in and out if I put the vinyl along it. So I ended up like hand sanding those inside things because I cut them to a stupid shape that no power tool can like fit inside and like making this piece I like walked myself down this whole road um, of like regrets but also like really getting close to these materials. So yeah, the, the neon inside there is one that I actually didn't bend myself. That's one that I rescued from a pile of trash. Um, I bought all this like crazy awesome neon equipment that was disused in a little warehouse. Um, it's like from the 80s and 90s that I got from rural Alabama thanks to Facebook Marketplace. And when I went there, this guy had like just a pile of all this broken glass. And he's like, oh, I don't know. That my friend used to do stuff in here like decades ago. So I was like, this has been sitting here that long. That's actually crazy. Then I was like, can I take some of, because he was just throwing away all of the old neons that they had ripped down from signage and stuff. So I took that one and a bunch of other ones. Um, a lot of the other ones are on that piece, which I will also make sure to mention in a little bit. But these 
um, hung in a lot of different signs for decades. So some of them were like Radio Shack signs, which I think is great. Um, it's very like on the nose to like hang a neon on a Radio Shack sign. But um, also there's a lot of them from Verizon. Apparently this guy who had this little shack that he was like doing neons in, he was the only person making all the signs for the Verizons in Alabama. So he like only made Verizon signs for a few years. So there's a lot of red and white. Um, but yeah, I rescued that neon out of a trash heap. And there's tax on there that I had left over from an upholstery project. And the wood is oak left over from another project. And then the vinyl is a refrigerator flap. So even though there's only a small list of materials, well, small for a sculptor, <laughs> I guess it's, you know, whatever, medium-sized list of materials, they're all, uh, the visual language that's happening is like another way in which I play with having some control, but also being open to sort of like the happenstance of using what I already have around me. I really enjoy um, nesting these neons that were like in signs and looked at for decades and then in a trash pile for another couple of decades. Hey, microphone. Um, uh, I really enjoy like nesting them back into some other found materials. It just feels like nice. Something like clicks when they're held that way. So, um, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk about how neons themselves are made. Th these two hanging up right here um, are both ones that I bent, and I feel like they are really good at illustrating the different qualities of two different gases. So the one that looks almost like salmon colored, although nobody seems to agree with me on what color this is, so like let's argue about it later. Um, I think it's like light salmon. Um, that one is just helium. Same as like just the helium that fills up the balloons at the store. So that is a clear glass tube with helium inside it. And another really cool sort of tie-in with the different materials, like I had talked about concrete with its liquid and solid states, glass with its liquid and solid states. The gas inside there is um, not visible at all when it turns off. So see this little light purple one? When it turns off, it's completely clear. Another thing that I love about that medium, especially in clear glass, is its ability to fully disappear. So it's clear when it's off, but there are little metal cups at the ends that are connected to little electrical wires, and the air just floating by and touching those little metal cups is how it illuminates. So the air plus electricity actually turns into plasma, which is like the state of matter we don't hang out with a lot. Um, and uh, so it has a certain way of moving. It has like a snaky, like almost liquidy way of moving. So the one in the other tube is argon. So when we talk about neons, sometimes they're filled with different gases. And all of the noble gases that are at the very top of the periodic table, that whole top row, those all phosphoresce in different colors. So neon is just the plain red, like that arch over there or this top little check would be easier to see maybe. That's just neon in a clear tube. So um, a lot of the other things that look like neons have different gases in them. But yeah, both of these were made with a little bit of um, accidents happening in them that actually I loved, which the one with just argon it's super, super light. It's like almost this smoky purple. And that's because um, I forgot to put in mercury. I was supposed to. Like I, somebody was teaching me how to do this thing, which is adding mercury to the argon. I think I like forgot because I didn't want to do it, even though it's super safe. Like you make a little bulb. It's like hermetically sealed in a little glass bulb that gets welded on to the glass and then there's a hole between and you just tip the mercury inside. So like you don't touch it at any point, but I, I was just like freaked out by the idea. So I forgot to add it into that one. It otherwise would have been super bright blue, like electric lightning blue. But because I forgot it, it's this super soft purple color. Um, and so yeah, I think that there is this magic that I just never get tired of, of like the neon tube getting filled with gas and how it, it just 
lights up with a little small bit of electricity. It's really high voltage, but it's really low amps. Um, so another really cool thing about it is if I accidentally have a neon next to like a lamp cord or something, it glows when it's like near another electrical thing that's lit. So even the electricity like moving inside them has this sort of nature of being like a lot and a little at once. So it has like a a way that it can pick up other electricity that's just coming off of a cord from something else. This one over here, um, this is the only one in the show that is broken in the way that I talk about in the artist statement and in the way that I like talk about and think about the show. There is a lot of breakage in these processes and actually some of those are broken. Like those were actually bigger pieces but you can't really tell that they're broken to become what they are. That one is for sure broken. It was like this big concrete grid that was hung up on this ridiculous system that I truly, truly believed was going to work. It was like a broom, it was like a broomstick with like a, it was a pool float that's supposed to be for tic-tac-toe, right? It's like a grid. So it's like draped over this broomstick and the broomstick was tied to a ladder and then there was like a cup that was supposed to catch all the concrete going in and I was like, great, this is great, it's gonna be perfect. So we, like, we mixed batches of concrete and we tried to pour it in. But um, as I was saying, concrete has other ideas. What it did is it made all of these little tiny um, like faults or like little cracks between the different buckets of concrete. Like I thought I was pouring it in fast enough that one would just mix with the other, but it would form like the tiniest little seal so it wanted to break at every single place where I put in a new bucket. So I, I thought at first there was like one crack, but then I was like, no, there's like 10 cracks. There's as many cracks as there were buckets of concrete that I put in there. So like it broke in the most major way. Um, and originally it was just sitting in my studio and I was trying to figure out how I'd put it back together. Some of it is glued in a really like, shitty way. Um, I did try, but then I realized that there was like this little wire running all the way through that's kind of the armature that was going to make sure that if it falls apart it doesn't fall all the way apart. So it's actually folded like this to fit onto that pedestal. So it's still like together in a way. It weirdly is just changed shape to be that way. And this piece, um, was honestly like really hard to sit with in my studio. It kept like reminding me of um, images that we see on the internet all the time about like buildings being bombed and like things being broken and and like I started to associate it with that piece and it was like really a challenge to not go like throw it in the dumpster. Um, so I was like, do I want to look at that and like think about that and not be able to get out of that? And then it was like. No, I really don't want to be totally avoidant about it. I found some different neons that fit inside of there and I think that the neons really want to like be like, hey, we're a fun, we're a party sculpture. And then like the concrete is so heavy and it's so broken that it's like, to me it still feels like a pile of ruins but I kind of think we have to exist that way. Um, this show has, a lot of like themes of grief throughout. Um, I've had like a really challenging year with like family members having some extreme medical things going on and a lot of uh, things that I had to like handle among working with the show. So I always have this like great amount of like joy and play when I'm making this work but also there's this like heaviness that is happening all the time and I realized after a while that that sculpture was just doing that and like rather than trying to rearrange it or trying to throw it away or trying to make it something different, I just like left it how it was and put some neons inside it. So the title um, over there, I thought about it being sort of a spell. The title is really long and it's the ending part of a poem that I wrote. But I really like the idea of that people uh, might say the title right there. and. It is, the title is about having a ceasefire and um, 
it's like a hard idea to hold on to that that could be possible. But one of my mentors um, from grad school and an artist who I really love named Greg Bordowitz, who a lot of his work is like very p tied in with um, political activism. He uh, always like talks about how to uh, to make a change, you know, on a small personal or a large level, you have to like first keep believing that it can happen. Um, so even though like it's really tiring, you have to like keep believing that it can happen. So I've had this relationship of like repeating, you know, the possibility that we can get out of this cycle and make it better. So I really liked hearing like maybe two people or a few people go over there and somebody would like murmur the title to somebody else. So I love how many people have like said this thing aloud or thought the thing right there. So I like, it's very small, but I like the idea of there being like a little spell right there that this is possible. Interestingly, uh, I didn't expect anything like directly to come out of that, but my dad, who has extremely difficult uh, political beliefs for me to swallow, sorry dad if you ever watch this, um, but uh, we have very like differing political opinions, like that's one of the, um, that title like I guess really spoke to him and it started this like long dialogue, how I had an outdated version of him. Uh, his political beliefs, but actually he's very like anti this this genocide as much as I am. And so we had like a really good and generative conversation. So even if like just that one conversation was the only thing that came of it, it was like still uh, really amazing to like get that piece out of my system and the the title itself. So I do think that this, that happening, um, is another thing that happens around a lot of these pieces in the room for me. There's this sort of split. There's this like playful immediacy with the medium of neon mixing with other things. And then there's like a bit of a depth in my thinking as the making um, happens. So this red like check neon up there and then this blue one behind you that sort of has these like uh, rope like things woven um, those I was also thinking of um, how structures of support and responsibility and families and things like that uh, they are they are this system that sort of like holds you up and ties you down sort of simultaneously there's this like lifting up and then there's also this like having to be responsible and like share yourself and share your feelings and share your skills and all the things with like the people around you that need them. So I was sort of processing like literal motherhood while making these things with the ropes and thinking of this like intertwining and this separating nature that happens. Um, and then the, the thing that I really enjoy is when I turn the light back on, because I do have it off so I don't like shock myself while using cement all around it because it gets very like sloppy and wet. Um, and then the moment when I turn it on is when I can really see how everything is like linked. So all of the little knots around it or all of the little links are like, for me, that transition point, the like liquid to solid or the like materials meeting each other, um, that's like the, the relationship moment like happens right there. Um, I'm always amazed too that this this is like rope dipped in cement. It's like hydrocal cement and I'm just amazed every time that it stands up. Like I know it does for a fact. I've been doing this for a while. But it's like I really just wet this stuff, wrap it around some stuff and then it holds that shape. So it's a really magical kind of like skeleton. Um, it's also very craft. Like that's the most like crafty um, like I have little scissors and I have like do, 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 and I wrap it and so that's almost more like a drawing process to me. It feels very like quick and like easy and there isn't really a right or wrong way to do it. Um, so that's very different than the sort of technical way that maybe neon or concrete has demands. Um, yeah, so this piece on the ground that is the blue ovals, um, you know, you can look at it or not. I don't know if you can see it. But that piece is called um, Every Last Thing in This Gentle Room. Two of those neon 
ovals are getting brighter and slower at the pace of like a very slow breath. So I don't know if that's like perceived or not and I'm kind of okay with it either way. I do think it's really interesting how it makes that corner brighter or dimmer. It sort of lets the other one be brighter and then it's brighter. They're like the sculptures are sharing space in this way, like they're trading off. But also I found it um, sort of hypnotic and relaxing, this like neon getting dimmer and brighter, something that I've actually never seen before because neons are usually like clicking on and off. Have I ever seen it before? No, I've never seen it before. But, but um, I had an idea for like how to do um, the electrical of it. For a moment, I walked. I was working with my little electrical friend William. We didn't quite get there. We'll do it another time. Um, but like, I was thinking of yeah, how to make this thing a little bit brighter and dimmer. So. I had the sort of electrical component of it worked out, like what needed to happen there, but I called this guy who makes the neon transformer boxes, like the little electrical dealies that are powering each and every one of these. And I had him make a box with like a dial so it could get faster and slower, the dimming itself. Um, so that was kind of cool. Like I collaborated on the phone with somebody across the country who did it for really cheap because it's just like, I don't know. Um, it was a fun project for us both, I think. But yeah, this, um, the, the breathing of the ovals is something that's easy to miss, but when I watch it, it really makes my sort of nervous system like settle down. And I was also thinking about breath touching every neon and how like our breath in the room touches everything. So a lot of this is like about interconnectivity. Um, yeah, so it's also like th that split saying like the fun thing and the deep thing is like, I, so a lot of these artworks also started from just making happen something that I wanted to see. Like I literally wanted to see the neon wrapped with something else. Over here I really wanted to see it just going in and out of the vinyl. And then um, that one I really wanted to see a neon like looking like it could breathe. And so then the sort of stories come in like slowly as I'm making it, but it often starts with a very impulsive desire like that. Like it's just something that I want to look at, to see. So there is a very like craft immediacy to the whole thing as well, like drawing. Um, I don't know that I'll spend a lot of time talking about those guys, um, except to just tell a little bit about the process of those other tubes. There's one in the middle, those two in the middle, um, actually, like the pink one and the white one, that are both these like tubular concrete things, they were concrete just cast into mailing tubes. And I added these little like fibers, um, like clothing fibers kind of, to make it strong enough to do those bends. Um, and so those shapes were kind of something found, but the pink one is actually going through, like it's, it's actually hugged by the concrete. So I really wanted to see it just holding and the concrete um, hardens and heats up a lot as it cools and it expands just a little. So it has to like be friends with the neon and like not crush it. And that one did actually crush the original and I had to put a different one in. So there's like this whole like process of, of trying and then um, the materials themselves, like, I don't know, they have their own plans. So this one in the back corner, um, largest piece in the show and one of the last things, like, this piece really resolved itself inside the room. Um, speaking of accumulation of materials, I originally started uh, designing cutting and welding this steel back in 2017. It was a project that I was trying to do with Ruth Stanford. Uh, it was a commission from Georgia Tech where we were gonna make this like mobile gallery. So it comes apart into two feet sections so you can like literally move it around. And our idea, uh, I'm surprised that they even supported it as far as they did um, because it was pretty like wacky. We wanted to let students sign up for micro residencies where they could have like 10 minutes or a few hours or something like that and do art projects or study in the structure or have a performance or whatever. Um, Cause our idea was sort of like a very uh, 
egalitarian, like what is, who's allowed to access art spaces, and the idea that anybody's like idea could just be in this little mobile gallery. So yeah, the university was really supportive. Eventually it kind of died in the water because of insurance, which is like so sad. They were like, it needs this crazy amount of insurance and we can't put it on the grass, but we also can't put it on the sidewalks or anywhere. And we were like, okay. And so it never really finished. So all this steel was sitting there. Um, Ruth was gonna recycle it as scrap. And it just like sat in her little storage thingy at Georgia State. And um, yeah, I was gonna build something similar for this. And I called Ruth up and I was like, is that steel still around? And she was like, oh yeah, you wanna take it to the scrapyard? And I was like, I think I wanna finish the thing. So I actually um, finished the making of this structure and it's modular, like those back things open. Originally I thought it was, I was gonna open it all the way to be like one big long wall. But I thought about how, um, you know, when talking about how like starting a piece with a little impulse and then following that desire, I thought about how I've never really been surrounded closely on all the sides with neon. And um, a neon works in a really simple way that's almost like a synthesizer in like the amount of electricity that it has is gonna make it brighter or dimmer. And synthesizers are like, they have something that makes the electricity audible, but like the notes are happen from it being like higher or lower electrical frequencies. So if I did like, instead of a neon, these same kind of transformers like could become like synthesizers. So anyway, I was thinking about the electricity that all electrical things that we have around us, like sh it sheds a little bit. It all has like a little bit of leak. And I had never been surrounded on all sides closely with neon. So that was my idea for this one. And it has, it, this is like the most um, elaborate version of that um, uh, accumulation. Like I talked about that with this other piece with the materials coming from somewhere else. So the steel was all handmade, um, hand welded by me and like Ruth cut a lot of it and our design was from years ago. So it's sort of like, whale sharking the like picking up the elements until now um, the ways that it would be put together now are different than it would have back then and most of these neons on there I saved from the garbage so the ones that I actually made myself are the pink ones which are actually tubes that are supposed to be blue but we put the wrong gas in them I had the neon company actually fill those with neon um, they're super great over there. Um, and then the little stair step shape and a few other ones I bent, but most of those are all just from this trash pile and I don't exactly know where they came from, but probably Verizon signs and Radio Shack signs. So yeah, I, I, this piece is called Tissue Thin Passage um, because I was also thinking about uh, how this thing started becoming a body of like accumulated experiences and these materials have been different places and been from different places and being brought here. So I was thinking about, um, yeah, the, w the way that our experiences are like this toolkit and like maybe we wear them and they can be helpful, maybe they can be like sort of difficult. I had like challenges of where to hang what because they weren't custom made for the structure. So it was like a, a retrofitting of how do they get applied there. And it's also like um, there's electricity. So it had to be done with a lot of care so that the whole entire thing isn't going to like electrocute a person. Um, and that was absolutely done. They aren't like fully touching the metal anywhere. Even the ones that are hanging, there's like space or there's spacer. And in some places I put like a little tiny bit of mica to deter the current away from the steel structure. So. That one was, um, in size, it's really big. Um, in process, I feel like it really shares space with these other guys, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that that's pretty much all that I want to cover with that. I don't want to over, uh, over explain these things too much because I want you to have your own um, experience with them as well. But I'd be really curious if it's okay, if we have time, I can open up for questions. Okay, Mocha show names. The gentle empty, different ways to stay home, a long time, the gentle drop, gently into the rare air, 
come on, y'all. <laughs> so embarrassing. Um, this is like getting to be like Tumblr gay. Um, <laughs> silence like rare air. Every last thing in this gentle room, which actually became the title of that oval one. In the gentle after, which is, I was thinking about that. For the whole show, this piece was like the idea for the show. That like just coming down point. Um, so the gentle after, the gentle empty. I don't remember writing this one. There might have been marijuana involved. Tonal hurt. <laughs> so maybe something later will be called tonal hurt. I don't know what that means, but we'll figure it out together. So yeah, I, I really like titles. I think that words, um, when people move through the gallery, I notice people really like to read the titles of just any place, like in a museum and any gallery show. Because I think that um, people coming from different backgrounds just have like different, different associations and maybe don't feel as comfortable just like walking up to things and being like, this is what I think. Um, for instance, I try to give, get people to give me tasting notes of like flavors of things. I'm like, what three things does it taste like? And a lot of people are like, no, I don't do that. Like, so it's like, I understand. Like you, somebody wouldn't just walk up to this, this sculpture and be like, this is what I think. So I think really, really hard about titles. I think they're super important and um, a way that a lot of people find a way into the work. So some of these titles are more playful and some of them have like a lot going on. This sculpture at the very bottom over here is called Coliseum Hangover Club um, because me and my best friend, uh, Eric Thurmond, went on a trip with my family and my sisters and their husbands and it was all like a very well behaved trip except me and my friend kept sneaking out at night to like go to clubs and like be silly. And so we were visiting the Roman Colosseum and we had like bad hangovers because I don't ever go out. And so um, we were like really regretting our decisions having a whole audio tour of the whole Colosseum. <laughs> Like, we were just like, and, and all the family photos were like, oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah, we took a thousand photos that day. But um, so that piece is actually just little droplets of concrete that are left over from the other casts. Like, no concrete was added to that on its own. It was just like, when I had concrete on my hands, I'd be like, Kuck. and so that one is like low to the ground because of that feeling. So yeah, Coliseum Hangover Club is like, is a real. They're usually like references to a super specific mood or moment. Thank you. Long answer to a short question, but I, I appreciate the um, access. Yeah. So generally, that's a really good question. Um, and that's kind of like sculpt. One of the things I love about sculpture is there is this problem solving of like its material needs are like they're a certain way. So usually with neons, you have either the plug is straight. Um, which is just called like a straight through, or there's this bend, like on the red one up top, it bends back, and that's called a double back. And so the cord can either like hide behind or it can just go straight out. So the cord is like a design consideration the whole time. And sometimes I'm really happy with like the decisions I made because the cord looks super easy. And sometimes I'm like, why did I not like put this one the other way? Because now I have cords like that, and then I have to like. Because another thing is, um, do you see that power box, how it's going down um, to the red one and the pink one both? That's like a big loop of power there. And those things can only be so long. So that one, like I would love to have those power boxes totally gone, not visible, but the way the power like moves and changes across the cords, it can only be that far away. So there is this sort of like, distance relationship where the box always has to be that close. So the cords do become really important. Um, and I have this idea that I like, I want the cords to be all crazy and messy. Like I tried to start with all the cords all out over here. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. They were doing shapes of their own and it looked like very medical with all the tubes everywhere. And so I cleaned everything up and hid it. But um, yeah, that is, that is a consideration. And, and I'm pretty new to making neon as far as like, I've been doing it for maybe a year and a half, but the amount of time that I've actually been able to make my own neons is like a lot smaller than that. So I don't know what I'm doing with the cords yet. And I've like learned a lot in this process, especially with that structure, trying to keep all the power boxes away from each other, but still close enough to the plugs is like a whole choreography. So sometimes the whole light moves because the power box needs to be somewhere. Um, 
Yeah, I do think that I like definitely when spilling buckets of concrete, like Aaron has probably heard me say that I, I do like to have a bad time sometimes. Like, but I think that, um, I think that the difficulty of these materials, rather than me trying to master them, I'm trying to do like an okay job of them. Like I am playing with that, um, playing with the technical limits a little bit. For instance, this one, if I'd have been able to get inside the, the plastic and like water it, it maybe wouldn't have cracked. Because like if you water concrete as it's drying, it will keep becoming stronger and stronger. But then hydrocal behaves the opposite. Um, any pieces that have this little rope with the hydrocal cement, that likes to get wet once and then be away from water. So I have to work it really, really fast. Because if it stays wet, it'll be soggy. So like those two processes are a little bit opposite. Like this kind of concrete stays wet for as long as possible. This other one needs to dry quickly. And, um, and yeah, they, they are difficult materials. And I find that to be like a ripe area for almost like collaborating with the materials rather than trying to make it do exactly what I want. I enjoy the learning, like I enjoy being low on the learning curve. Like I feel like I'm very amateur at neon and at concrete. Like I know I can make it look like I know what I'm doing because it works-ish, but like these are all kind of different than how I planned them. And so I think that the difficulty of the material is kind of exciting. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you.